for you are God. I mean, where else would we want to go? Father, you're sovereign over all things. You are so good and so faithful to your people. Why would we feel... Why would we feel depression or sorrow over our current situation in this nation? So God, we look to you. Our eyes turn to you. For you are our delight. You are our love. You are our mercy. You are our God. But at the same time, God, we lift up our nation to you. Father, I pray that you cause your people to go to their knees and cry out to you. To seek you. And I pray that you cause the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, to ring out over this land and over this world. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. God, I pray that you cause your church, your people, to continually preach the gospel, sing the gospel, live the gospel, be the gospel to a world that desperately needs the gospel. Father, our only hope is in you. So God, as we open your word, Help us to see that hope. And that hope has a name. And his name is Jesus Christ. And all these things ask your son's precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Mark chapter 9 as we're continuing our series through the book of Mark. And once again, just want to remind uh, those who are here, if you want to ask a question, shout it out. But don't be surprised if I repeat your question um, because we've noticed that some people who are watching online who... They'll, they'll say, and Steve, Steve's noticed this, they'll say, you know, I can't hear the question or what they're asking. So don't be surprised if I repeat your question out loud for the sake of those who are watching live online. Um, those who are watching live online, if you want to ask a question, um, that you can post it on Facebook. Uh, and I'll get to that question and try to answer it later. I can't do it right now, uh, but I'll try to get to it. So because I, I, I got a feeling there's going to be a lot of questions about uh, what we're looking, about, looking at tonight. Tonight we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 13. And we're going to be looking into the transfiguration of Jesus. And so I'm going to read Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does not first restore all things. I'm sorry. And Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. This is the word of God. So as, we, as we've been walking through the book of Mark... We've, we, we have seen that Mark is, is seeking to answer that most important question. Who is Jesus? Or repeating the, uh, the questions that the disciples put to themselves when Jesus calmed the storm. Who then is this man that even the wind and the waves would obey him? And what we've seen so far is that uh, Jesus has been a little cryptic. He's been a little... Um, a little veiled in who he actually is, even though he's, he, he's claiming to forgive sins, uh, even though we, we, we've seen him raise the dead, uh, even though he's, he, he's healed the, uh, the leper. He's done all of these things uh, that should cause us to be amazed, and yet the disciples are still confused about who he is. And so our text tonight, what we're going to see is that Jesus is pushing further his identity. 
he starts to really reveal himself. So, so just as cryptic as he is in the first seven chapters of the book of Mark, now in Mark chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 9, he doesn't just pull the veil back a little bit. He opens the curtain wide open so that the disciples can truly see who he is. And, and, it, and it is here in our text tonight where we can truly see who Jesus is. So this is what, this is what we're going to do tonight, all right? Uh, my uh, uh, outline tonight, if you're taking notes, is based on geography, okay? And so this event, the transfiguration of Jesus, take place, takes place on top of a mountain. And so point number one is going to be ascend. Point number two is summit. And then point number three is descend. Uh, because that's basically what Mark does with the narrative. Mark does, what, what, what Mark does is he uh, opens the door to a conversation that's happening going up a mountain. And then he records the events on top of the mountain. And then he records the conversation coming down the mountain, okay? So we're going to ascend, we're going to summit, and then we're going to descend, okay? So let's look at the ascent. Something happens, or, or a conversation takes place as they're walking up the mountain. But before we get to that conversation, we got to remind ourselves of the context. And we got to remind ourselves of the pattern in Mark of Jesus' self-revelation. Like I said, uh, leading up to Mark chapter 8, he's been a little cryptic. But, but in Mark chapter 8, he starts to reveal himself. And so take your Bibles and look at Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Let's remind ourselves of, of the context and of the pattern that Mark is setting before us. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And the beginning of verse 32 says what? And he said this what? Plainly, all right? We love the word plainly. Nobody, nobody, likes, uh, nobody likes people who beat around the bush. I love straightforward commercials. I love watching, you, you, you watch a commercial and you'll see these images take place and you're going, what in the world is this commercial all about? And then there'll be a picture of someone wearing a pair of jeans. And you're like, that's a jeans commercial? I had no idea. If that person did not show up wearing a pair of jeans, I, had, I would have no idea that that was a jeans commercial. I always... W like the idea of having an advertisement company where a guy just comes out and goes, this is dishwasher soap. Look, it washes dishes. Use it. It's pretty cool. And that's it. Right? That's my kind of commercial. Right? Very simple. And he said it plainly. Look, it works. Just buy it. Okay? All right, I'm not trying to sell you on something weird. It's just dish soap. That's all it is. It works. Go buy it. And here Jesus is saying, look, this is who I am. There's no tricks no nuance, there's no, uh, there's, there's no uh, odd parable here, some, some weird teaching. I'm telling you, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected, be killed, and after three days, rise again. There's no beating around the bush. I'm saying it plainly to you so you know what to expect, what, 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 what's about to happen. And in fact, from Mark chapter 8 all the way to the end of the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 16, that's exactly what we see happening to Jesus. He is rejected. He is, uh, he, he suffers many things. He is killed, and after three days, he rises again. Literally what Mark does, Mark uses those four things as a four-point sermon or a four-point outline for the rest of his narrative. But that four-point outline, that four-point sermon that Mark is preaching to us in his gospel begins with the transfiguration. In a few minutes, we're going to see why. And so the door is swinging here, okay? So the first seven chapters of Mark is, is, is about the, the life of Jesus leading up to the work of Jesus on the cross. And the door is Mark 8 and 9. And that door is now swinging open to show us what Jesus is going to do. And so in Mark chapter 8, Jesus reveals himself and his purpose. But in our text tonight, the revelation of his identity will come from somewhere else. And it begins with a walk up the mountain, all right? And so put a pin in that somewhere else thing. Where, who else is revealing Jesus' identity? We're going to see in a minute. It's very important, a very important point to make. But look at Mark chapter 9, verse 2. All right, so here's the ascent. A conversation takes place on the way up the mountain. So Mark chapter 9, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. Now, notice that phrase, after six days. This is very unusual for Mark. Time signatures in the book of Mark is very unusual. Usually Mark does not care very much about how long something takes. In fact, it's in Mark chapter 14, verse 1, I believe, where we, we, have, where, we own, where we have the only other time signature in the book of Mark. In fact, remember I told you that, that one of Mark's favorite words is the word again. 
And again, Jesus went on to the other side. And again, Jesus went to the next town. And again, and again, and again, and again. So, so Mark is trying to do things. He's trying to say things rapidly, but he's trying to slow down doing it. And so he doesn't, he's not going to use any time signatures. So why would he mention this six, day, six days? Well, what, what's the purpose of all this? Well, it's, it's significant because uh, in the book of Exodus, the glory cloud of God, the, the, the glory of God came and sat on top of Mount Sinai for how long? Yes, you guessed it. Four, six days. And I don't know if you noticed, but as I read this text, this should really, really, really cause you to be reminded about the book of Exodus. The fact that God is meeting on the mountaintop with his people, with his disciples, if you will, should automatically make you go, hmm, there might be a connection between the book of Exodus and what's happening here on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there is. And it begins with this time signature. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. It was after six days that God spoke to his people at the base of the mountain. And here... After six days, Jesus takes his, takes his people up on the mountain and talks with them. In other words, what's happening here is Mark is saying, Jesus is God himself. But there's another connection to the book of Exodus, all right? And it's in this phrase. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. So after six days... Jesus takes his disciples up onto the mountain, and it was a high mountain. Many scholars believe this was probably Mount Hermon, because this was the highest mountain that was near to where Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi. And Mount Hermon was a very high mountain, and so it's very likely that Jesus climbed up that mountain, walked up that mountain with Peter, James, and John, intentionally uh, making a connection between the book of Exodus and what happened there at, Mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai and with himself. And so what this means for us is that what, what we're starting to do here, what, what, what Mark is trying to, start trying to do here is he's trying to remind us that God is a God who welcomes sinners into his presence. I mean, the fact that he says, Peter, James, and John, you three guys come with me. Now, remember, he took Peter, James, and John with him to go heal Jairus' daughter, to raise her from the dead. I mean, that was, a, that was a, a huge miracle. That was a miracle of all miracles to raise somebody from the dead. And here Jesus is including these three guys up that mountain to, to witness something otherworldly altogether. Now, let me ask you a question. Why these three guys? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. But Jesus chose Peter, James, and John to witness these things. Now, now there's, a, there's, a, there's probably a more clear answer for Peter. It's because Peter was chosen to be the mouthpiece of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, he was kind of the head disciple. And Jesus had this sort of leadership technique where, 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 it was, where it was him, then it was the three, then it was 12, and then it was the crowds. And that's how he treated things. He had his inner circle, the three, and then he had the outer circle, the 12, and then he had the crowds. And so what he was doing is he was including these three men into his inner circle. He's, he's including these three men into this, trans, this event of the transfiguration in order for them to be witnesses to this after the resurrection. And so this reminds us that God is a God who welcomes sinners into his presence. Welcomes sinners into his presence to witness and, and be a part of just otherworldly things all together. And so that's what's happening on the way up to the mountain. Now look what happens when they get to the top of the mountain, the summit. All right, look at chapter 9, verse 2 again. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up, uh, led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. He was transfigured before them. Look at verse 3. And his cloud, and, I'm sorry, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Now, notice several things. First of all, notice the redundancy. All right, look at verse 3 again. So Jesus takes these guys up onto the mountain. He's transfigured. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean? Well, we find part of the answer in verse 3. His, his clothes became radiant, intensely white. Now, in the Greek, the, the, those, those three or four words basically mean the same thing. And there's, there's a repetition of words in the original Greek. And when you see redundancy like that in the original languages, it means times five. All right. If something is bright and it says and, and, you, and you read and it was brightly bright, bright, it means it was like times 10 bright. 
And here, Mark is trying to say, look, I can't, I can't even quite describe the, the whiteness and the, and the intensification of the light that emanated off of Jesus himself. I mean, it's beyond anything I could possibly describe. In fact, it was so white that, that he says, as no one on earth could bleach them. And that's an odd phrase to translate from the Greek into, into the English. It literally is a phrase that means no expert of, 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 no expert in clothing could create a bleach that could match the whiteness that we saw coming off of Jesus Christ. And so in a twinkling of an eye, as they're walking up the mountain, and they come to the summit of this mountain, in a twinkling of an eye, all of a sudden, Jesus just gets lit, he just lights up right there in front of them, right? And I'm surprised they didn't run for their lives. But what the transfiguration is, what we're seeing here, is we're seeing a glimpse of Jesus' divine glory. It looks sort of like this. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 1. Look at Revelation chapter 1. And once again, keep in mind that this is Jesus being revealed fully. Now, <clears throat> what's funny, maybe a little tongue-in-cheek here, but when Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, verse 32, and he said this plainly, this is the manifestation of Jesus saying things plainly. <laughs> He's like, look, I can't get any clearer than this. Boom! Right? The whole mountain lit up. And they're going, whoa! I mean, you can't get any more plain than that. This is who I am. I am God in the flesh. Now behold me in my glory. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. This may be what Peter, James, and John was seeing. Oddly enough, this is the same John who witnessed the transfiguration. And listen to what John sees. When I saw him... I'm sorry, back up, look, look at verse, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool. You see the redundancy? White like white wool. Why would you repeat that? Why wouldn't you say white like wool? The redundancy is there in order to basically intensify what, what, what he's seeing. It's like white wool times 10. Like snow. Again, there's redundancy. White, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I felt his feet like a dead man. This may, may well have been exactly what Peter, James, and John saw on that mountain that day. And let's not miss the, again, let's not miss the connection to the book of Exodus here. When Moses went to meet with God on Mount Sinai, and, and Moses was in, the, was in the presence of the glory of God for that long, what happened when Moses descended? What, 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 was, what was different about Moses as he descended to come back to God's people? He was lit up like a, like, you know, like a nightlight, <laughs> He, 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 the, the, he was so bright with the glory of God that, remember, the, the, the people had to put a veil, a tent, over his face and cover his face because they could not look upon Moses. Like the sun. In fact, that's what the text says. Here, Jesus embodies the glory of God. Jesus, this is the amazing thing, Jesus it d does, not, uh, does not reflect the glory of God like Moses did. Because Moses came under the, it was like being sunburned. You're in the sun, you come out and you go, whoa, you've been in the sun. Why? Why? Because you can see it. I'll, I'll bask in the sun. Here, Jesus is being displayed as the sun. <laughs> He's not reflecting the glory of God. He is the glory of God. And he said this plainly. It's as if Jesus, he's going back to the original question, right? In, in, in Mark chapter 8, uh, verse 31, or, or uh, verse 27. Who do people say that I am? Now, notice how far we've come. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And then fast forward, within six days, he's going, I'm God. <laughs> I don't reflect the glory of God. I am the glory of God. I am God in the flesh. And so though this is a glimpse of Jesus' divine glory that is veiled in flesh, the context is still interesting. Look at chapter 8, verse 38. Look at chapter 8, verse 38. We read, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, 
Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the what glory of his Father with the holy angels. In here he's revealing himself as the glory of the Father, right here. In other words, we get a hint at what Jesus will be like when he returns. So when Christ returns, he will return in the very glory of God. Again, this is the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is, is Jesus unchained, Jesus unfettered, Jesus completely unveiled. There, there, there's kind of a, there's kind of a, a section of Christianity or, or vein running through uh, modern Christianity where, where they focus on Jesus, you know, meek and meek and mild. Yeah, Jesus meek and mild. Here we have Jesus mighty and majestic. We have Jesus the judge, the Jesus the righteous, Jesus the glorious, Jesus the scary. In fact, Peter's scared out of his own wits, scared out of his own mind, didn't even know what to say. But Jesus isn't the only glorious figure to appear at the summit of this mountain, is he? Look at chapter 9, verse 4. I, this is, man, I love this verse. I, I, you know, you always hear people say, uh, you know what, when I get to heaven, I got some questions. You know what I mean, and I always laugh at that. I'm like, no, you don't. You're not going to ask any questions. But let me play that card for a second, okay? When I get to heaven, I want to find Elijah and Moses and go and just ask, what were you guys talking about on that mountain? Look at chapter 9, verse 4. And there appeared to them Mo Elijah with Moses, and they were what? Talking. <laughs> and I, I mean, okay, again, I don't mean to, like, I'm not trying to be irreverent, but, but comically, you know, you can kind of see Jesus and Moses and Elijah walking up to, to each other, and Moses going, hey, hey, Jesus, how are they treating you? How's the food? How, you know, you try that coffee shop around the corner? I mean, do, do they, is that thing still over there, the thing where, where you know, they have, the, they have the best, like, donuts? Is that still over there? Do they still do that over there? And Elijah's going, stop asking those questions. He's here on a mission. Jesus, well, how's things going, you know? And they're having this conversation about things. And you're like, what was that conversation about? They were talking. And I'm like, why didn't Mark record that conversation? <laughs> Right, right. Well, that's, what, that's my next point. Well, so why these two guys? Why Moses and Elijah? Well, the traditional understanding, Steve, the traditional understanding is that, well, Elijah represents the prophets. Moses represents the law. And as they're coming to Jesus, they're saying, all right, Jesus is taking up the mantle. What we represent points to Christ. And so, Jesus, it's your, it's your, it's your time now. It's your moment now. And, and I, I, think, I think the point is true. But I think it's, I, I, I disagree with the traditional understanding that it's about the law and the prophets. Because if you're going to choose a prophet, wouldn't you expect Jeremiah or Isaiah to show up? Because he, they wrote big books of the Bible, right? Um, and, and Elijah was, was one of the first prophets. Uh, and and they, they record a little bit about his life. But there's so, much, there's so much more about Isaiah and Jeremiah. In fact, the Gospels, the Gospels quote the prophet Isaiah more than, more than any other prophet. So what, you, would, you would think it, was, it would be Isaiah. And not only that, but Moses is called a prophet. So is Moses representing the law and the prophets, and Elijah is representing the prophet? I mean, it, it's just, it's too nuanced there. I think this is it. I think it's because Elijah and Moses were seen in Judaism at that time, and all, leading up to that, as heroes of the faith. I mean, they were the outside of David. They were the penultimate. I mean, if, if you were to, if you were to walk around the first century uh, first century Palestine and ask little Jewish children who's your favorite Bible character, the, in the top three would be Moses and Elijah every time, every time, right? And, and it's because because they were heroic characters, they were faithful to God. They had mountaintop experiences. Both of them had mountaintop experiences, and there was an end times expectation in the Jewish mind that right before the Messiah returned, a prophet like Moses would come, and Elijah would come. Remember, in in, in the book of uh, book of uh, uh, Micah, I think that Elijah would return to announce the coming of the Messiah. And in Deuteronomy 4, there was an expectation that a prophet greater than Moses that was going to come. And here, these two guys show up. And they, they're, they're essentially saying, it's not about us. We're here, and we're not here about us. Right, yeah, it's about Jesus, right? We're here to promote Christ. And so, to answer your question, Steve, Elijah and Moses, they appeared to confirm who Jesus is. So watch this now. Again, and he said this plainly, Jesus pulls back the veil of who he is, 
to display and to expose himself as being the glory of God, right? Then Moses and Elijah show up to say, yeah, okay, it's all about Jesus to further confirm. And then, and then you hear a voice from heaven <laughs> confirming who Jesus actually is. But I want to notice something first. Notice that as Jesus is unveiled as the glory of God, remarkably, something doesn't happen. Now, remember in the book of Exodus, when the glory of God uh, came upon the, the mountain, right? And, and, and what, did, what, did, uh, what did God say to Moses? Moses, don't let the people break out and come touch the mountain because what? They'll die, right? And then Moses says, God, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your face. And God says, you can't see my face because if you do, you'll what? Die, all right? Remember when the temple was built, the tabernacle of the temple was built, and the Shekinah glory rested over the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. And, and, and no one was allowed to go in there but the high priest, and only after he had been consecrated, remember the book of Leviticus, only after he's been consecrated, been washed, been prepared, could he go in. Because if he doesn't, what will happen? He'll die. So there's a common theme here when associated with the glory of God, that no human being... No human being could be in the presence of the glory of God and live. In fact, that's what uh, God, tells to Mo God, God says to Moses. No human being can see my face and live, Moses. There's no way. You gotta, I'll put you in the cliff of the rock and I'll cause you to see my backside as I pass by. And God announces his identity to Moses. So let me ask you a question. If that's true, and if the Shekinah glory has come down upon this mountain, which I think that this is what this cl cloud is, and Jesus is the glory of God, then how... In the world, is Peter, James, and John still alive? H how could they live through this? Well, let me, let, let me propose something. All right, oh, Before you ask your question, Russell, the reason why they're alive is because Jesus is with them. That's why they're alive. <laughs> All right, I hope we get this right. Look at Peter's words in chapter 9, verses 5 to 6. Listen to what he says, okay? Oh, Peter, open mouth, insert leg. Look at chapter 9, verse 5. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Listen, uh, from now on, when scared, shut up. You know what I mean? Just be quiet, let God talk, right? But Peter's so afraid, his fear causes him to talk. Because Peter knows something. See, Peter knows the book of Exodus like you do. Peter knows the tabernacle rule like you do. Peter knows that when God's glory shows up, you die. Peter knows that you cannot go into the Holy of Holies uh, where, the, where the presence of the glory of God is because you will die. And so the reason why Peter says, hey, Jesus, let us make a tent for you and a tent for Elijah and a tent for Moses is because he knows that in order for him to be in the presence of the glory of God, a temple has to be there. There has to be some protection between him and the glory of God. In fact, the word tent is the Hebrew transliteration of tabernacle. Let, us, let me build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And the reason why they don't die it's because Jesus is the tabernacle. Jesus is right there. In other words, Peter is recognizing that there has to be something, some kind of protection between me and between God in order for me to see and exist in the presence of God. There's some kind of gap. There's some kind of chasm here. And, 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 and in my Old Testament religion, it was a tabernacle that bridged that gap. It was the sacrifices that bridged that gap between me and God. But here on this mountain, it's not the tabernacle that's going to save them. It's Christ that's going to save them in, in, in the presence of the glory of God. You ever thought about, I mean, you, all, you, you think about heaven, you're like, I cannot wait to be in the presence of the glory of God. And that's a good thing to think, and you should think that, and that should bring you joy. But at the same time, it should scare you to death. <laughs> that the only thing, the only person that's protecting you in that presence is Christ himself. That's it. And that's a beautiful thing, right? Amen. That I can walk and leap and have joy in the presence of God and the glory of God because of what Christ has done for me. Because of Jesus. So the reason why these three men, these three guys, especially after Peter opens his big mouth, the reason why these three guys don't drop dead is because Jesus is with them. And in fact, God confirms 
what I just said. Look at look at John chapter, I mean Mark chapter 9, verse 7. And a cloud overshadowed them, overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. And essentially, I'm going to read it, but essentially what God says next is this. Don't think about the tabernacle. Don't think about the temple. Why? This is my beloved son. What? Listen to him. He interprets the law. The law is, inter is interpreted through him. The tabernacle, the temples. And Steve, in that one phrase, mountains of PhD dissertations have been written. Everything in Scripture, everything that Scripture points to is now interpreted through him. It's all about him. Moses and Elijah shows up to confirm it. Jesus opens himself up to reveal that he is the glory of God. And here God himself now says, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. So everything that we do and that we say has to be about Christ. It has to be. If not, we, we've missed the mark altogether. I don't ever want to preach a sermon where an Orthodox Jew and a Muslim is, is comfortable under my preaching. I don't. Everything we do has to end with Christ. Everything we, we say and do has to, has to end with, with saying something like, consider Jesus, look to Christ. Because the Father himself says, this is my beloved son, look to him, listen to him, listen to him. So it wasn't Jesus revealing himself here, it was the Father revealing Jesus. The Father himself revealing who Jesus is. Now, Look at the drama of chapter 9, verse 8. Look at the drama. This is so awesome. I love this. And suddenly, see, that's marking that's Mark language right there. Again and again and again. Suddenly, right? He's speeding up in order to slow it down so, so that it can sink into your own heart. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw who? Anyone. Anyone with them but what? That's all that's left. I love that. Right? There's this build up. They're walking up the mountain. You know what I mean? They get up there and Jesus goes, ta-da! Throws open the road, throws open the curtain. And he's it lit up, glory of God. All of a sudden Moses and Elijah's there. What is going on? Cloud voice. Ah! And all of a sudden, ah! And they look and it's just the unemployed homeless carpenter standing there. That is so poignant. That is so, like, if you miss that, 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 in other words, that buildup, it, 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 it's intended to replicate the buildup in the Old Testament, right? Creation, the fall, the law, the temple, the tabernacle, the exile, the, the, the prophecies, and here it comes! Unemployed homeless carpenter. He's the end of it all, Jesus. It's all about Christ. So it's interesting that at the summit, the summit ends with quiet. It ends with silence. And that's how you want it. That's how you want it to end. When it's just Jesus and you. No cloud, no bright light, just Jesus and you. Just Christ, right? That's how you want it to end. And that's the point here. The point of the summit event is to get you one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And Jesus asking you face-to-face, -face, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And do you believe all this? And then look at the descent, the descending down off the mountain. Look at chapter 9, verse 9. Chapter 9, verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one <laughs> what they had seen. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's, that, that's like, can you imagine Peter, James, and John? And, and, and they're walking down going, scared of their mind. They're kind of taking short steps, and Jesus is walking ahead of them. Jesus goes, oh, yeah, by the way, all that stuff, guys, you can't tell, you can't tell the, the other nine disciples. What? <laughs> Are you joking? Come on. That was good stuff, Jesus. We can't say. Now, why do you think Jesus told them not to tell, any, tell, tell anybody about what they saw? Right. It, because, Steve, it was on this side of the resurrection. Right? Right. Yeah, Peter, what if Peter walked, walked, walked up to his friend Benjamin 
and said, you never guess what I just saw. You see that guy over there? I know he looks plain, but you know what I saw on that mountain, right? And the guy goes, whatever. But after the resurrection, after the resurrection, there was a power to it because the Holy Spirit had fallen on these apostles, and that's what they wanted to talk about. Listen, this Jesus whom you crucified, remember, remember the day of Pentecost? This Jesus whom you crucified, God raised him from the dead. And then later in that sermon, Peter says, Jesus was very God of very God. Now they're talking. Now they're talking transfiguration language, but only after the resurrection. And Jesus is telling them, I don't want you to talk about this until after I've been raised from the dead. And then when I'm raised from the dead, it will have a power to it because the Holy Spirit will use that message for many people to come to faith in my name. But, if, but inevitably, this conversation produces confusion. Look at chapter 9, verse 10. <laughs> chapter 9, verse 10. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. <laughs> you know, as they're walking down the mountain, they're like, what do you think, what do you think he means about rising from the dead? What's this resu- well, we know about resurrection because we believe as Jews that when the Messiah comes, all the dead would be raised. But what is he talking about? They're confused about about all these things. And so uh, they speak up, look at chapter 9, verse 11. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Because that was a traditional belief. And that's true, right? Elijah was was to come first, proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, and then the Messiah was to come. But what they were, what they themselves, the, the, the apostles themselves, who knew, who knew the Elijah that has already come, did not recognize him as the Elijah who has already come. Who was the Elijah that had already come? John the Baptist, right? And so they're confused. They're, 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 they're so befuddled in their own minds. They're trying to line up the events. It's, it's, like, it's like trying to make an, an end times prophecy chart and being way off. You know, the end of the world will be here, but first this must happen, but first this must happen. No, 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 no. It's like they're, they're just trying to figure it all out. And Jesus is like, you're missing the point, guys. You're missing the point entirely. Look at verse 12. And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? You see what he's doing there? He's taking it back to Mark chapter 8, verse 31. He said, you're missing the point. Stop looking for the end of the world. I can't tell you how many, how many, oh man, Facebook and Instagram and all these like Christians out there going, you mean, oh, this is fulfilling biblical prophecy. <laughs> Stop it. You know what I mean? Just stop. This is happening. This, look at this. This was predicted in, in you know, first, first hesitations. It's crazy. And this is what these guys are doing. They just experienced the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And they're walking down going, okay, so wait a minute. This is happening. This is, I mean, you know, and, you know, I can understand that. I can understand them trying to go, I'm like, I'm trying to make sense of this, but, but they're way off base. And what does Jesus do? He says, you're missing the point. The point is that it is written, the scriptures, don't miss that word, it is written. If you underline things in the Bible, underline that phrase, very important phrase. Is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? In other words, Jesus is saying the end is way off until that happens. Until I die on the cross, until I, until I atone for sins, until I am actually living out physically the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world on the crucifixion, the end matters not. <laughs> Focus on the cross. Isn't that, the, isn't that the, 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 the message of the whole New Testament? Look, not even, not even the Son knows. Not even the Son knows. Focus on the message of the cross. Don't go out there going, look, it's, it was predicted in the Bible that this is... No. The cross has already happened. What the world needs now is not to hear messages of fulfillment of Bible prophecy. What the world needs desperately... Oh my gosh, we were just talking about the debates before, before he clicked record. It was good that, it, that, that he didn't click record until after we were done talking about the debates. Because people would be mad at me. But... but, but the, if you watched the debates last night, it's painfully obvious, it's wonderfully obvious that what the world needs right now is the cross of Jesus Christ, right? My goodness. That's what the world needs right now is the cross of Christ. So what Jesus does is he refocuses them back to the main thing. And I love this is why I love Jesus. Jesus uh, makes the main thing the plain thing and the plain thing the main thing. And he said this plainly. 
He goes back to, he said this plainly. Is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Look at verse 13. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. You know, talk about Bible prophecy. <laughs> right there, Jesus is speaking prophetic utterances that the scriptures have written about me. The scriptures have said that I must come and be crucified. And leading up to that, someone is going to come and proclaim that I have come. And that's what John the Baptist did, right? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then within two or three years after that proclamation, possibly two or three years after that proclamation, what do we have? Jesus on the cross, fulfilling that. And that's what we need. That, that's the conversation descending off the mountain. You see, us Christians, we, we um, and I have a huge desire. Sorry, Steve, I just hit the microphone. I have a huge desire to, to, to go up on that summit. I mean, after watching the debates last night, I have, a ma I have a massive desire to go up on the summit of that mountain and just sit in the glory of God and just ignore the world, <laughs> you know? Um, just like plug my ears and go, la, 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 you know, just ignore everything. But here, the gospel requires that we come down off that mountain. We come down off that mountain with the most important message of all. Christ has come. Christ has died. Repent and believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're required to do. I mean, some, a, lot of, a lot of times the, the stuff that I see in, uh, happening around us makes me want to go and hide. makes me want to just ignore everything and live in my own little Christian bubble. But that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to come down off the mountain and go into the world with the message of the gospel, because that's what the world desperately needs. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. The fact that he has revealed himself to us. That we see him here in the scriptures in his glory. For who he is, the Lord of, of all creation, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And God, though the summit of that mountain looks so beautiful, looks so welcoming, looks so inviting, and we're like Peter, and we go, hey, let's just set up a village up here and live up here and just ignore everything else that's happening in the world. We can't. We've got to come down off that mountain with the good news of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners. Father, thank you for the greatness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. All these things ask your son's precious name. Amen. I will now take your questions. You look betwixt. I did. Right. No, he's, he's, he's referring to uh, John the Baptist. So, so, so the restore all things, yeah, the, the restore all things uh, is a Jewish apocalyptic, is Jewish apocalyptic language, you know, because that's the language they're, they're talking about right now, you know, cause, because they're using Jewish apocalyptic ideas like the, like the, like what is this rising from the dead thing? They, there was a, they know what resurrection was. That, but the resurrection that Jesus was talking about sounded different than the one that they believed in because they believed that there was only one resurrection that was at the end of time, right? There was no, for them, there was no belief that the Messiah would be raised from the dead first and then the resurrection. So Jesus is using a Jewish apocalyptic language to speak to them and they knew what he was talking about, you know? Yeah, and, and, and even in the Old Testament when, when, there's, uh, when there's prophecies about Elijah that it was to come, there was never language about him restoring all things, but when he came, it meant the restoration of all things. It meant that that was a sign, you know what I mean? But they thought literal Elijah was showing up. They weren't expecting some guy eating locust and wearing camel hair and living out in the wilderness and talking crazy, you know what I mean? Yeah, they keep an empty chair. Yeah, they keep an empty chair. And when, so when the, so when those on, uh, if you're watching online, uh, so so when Jews celebrate the Passover or have the have Passover Seder, they will keep an empty chair at the dining room table 
Uh, and that was a symbol of their expectation of Elijah still to come. They're still, they're still waiting for Elijah to show up. Um, right, somebody knocks at the door to symbolize that he's, yeah, symbolizing that he's here. Yep, yeah. Have nothing. Yeah, absolutely. You have nothing. Yeah. Right. It's a good, great point, Susan. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, and 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 he did that. Like there were droves of people going out into the wilderness being baptized, and he said, "Be baptized in preparation of the Lord to meet the Lord." You know what I mean? And so in that, that was kind of a, re a restoration of all things. Or it was the, it was sort of the inbreaking of the kingdom. You know, the kingdom of, that that was kingdom activity. You know what I mean? It was like a, a I can't remember his name. Um, I can see the book. Anyway, famous theologian who 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 talked about those uh, those actions at the beginning of the Gospels, like John the Baptist and all that stuff. You know that, that preliminary stuff. He's talking. He was talking about that. That's kind of like tilling the soil of planting the seeds of the kingdom. John the Baptist is tilling that soil, waiting for the seeds to be planted. And then when Acts rolls around, the seeds are being put in the ground, right? And then when you read the Pauline letters, the seeds are growing into the kingdom. And now we are the garden of the kingdom of God. You know what I mean? So yeah, George George Ladd. That's the Sorry, just hit me. Anyway, uh, any any other questions? Or I love Peter, man. Yeah, I love Peter. I just I love his. <laughs> he's so he's so compulsive. I relate to him so much. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like 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 Peter. So like God hasn't spoken yet. Like God has not said, "This is my beloved son. Listen to him." Um, and there's another piece there I'll talk about in a minute that I could have mentioned, but I, I I didn't. But um. You, you can imagine, like, 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 so you're not hearing anything yet. There's this Jesus in this blinding, dazzling light, right? And can you imagine Peter, and you guys don't like uncomfortable silences? You know what I mean? So, like, it's, it's like, this, it's like, oh, and Peter's going, somebody should, somebody should say something. <laughs> you know, like, you know, Elijah, Moses, Jesus, it's a really momentous occasion. We should kind of celebrate or something. And they're like, shh, shut up. You know, he's like, you're ruining the moment for us. You know what I mean? It's just, I love this. I just love that portrait where he's like, golly. And remember, you know, Mark was, was a traveling partner of Peter. And very likely, these are Peter's sermons that Mark is recording and, and compiling a gospel. He's, he compiled this gospel based on uh, Peter's teachings. And so Peter, this is Peter's memory. Peter's telling on himself. Like, yeah, man, I can really ruin things, you know. <laughs> I can really ruin a moment. Yeah, 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 let me, yeah, I, I can fix things, you know. And again, it comes from a heart of like, I want to participate in what God's doing, but at the same time, don't, you know, just don't, Peter. Just, but here's a piece I, 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 I didn't mention in my little teaching or sermon or whatever you want to call it right here, Nancy, and, and it's this, well, everybody here, it's this. Peter's the first one to talk. And when God talks, He's telling people, Peter, shut up. Listen to my son. Right? Don't talk. Listen to my son. Listen to him. All right? There's no talking involved. What you need to do is listen to him. Okay? You, you, you. So the whole thing, okay, who talks first? You talk first? I talk first? And God's like, my son always talks first. All right? That's the problem. The problem is we talk first. And that's when we get ourselves in trouble. You know what I mean? Um, Yeah, it doesn't say that Jesus was like, oh, guys, I'd like to introduce you Moses, and, uh, and on my left here's Elijah. They, yeah, so how did they, there's no, like, you know, camera phones back then. You're like, that looks, yeah, yeah. They knew, Peter knew who it was. You know what I mean? I mean, so I think somewhere in the conversation, I think even though the conversation is not recorded here, I think Peter may have heard some things in the conversation. Like Jesus is like, hey, Elijah, and Peter's like, whoa. And he's like, and Jesus goes, hey, Moses, and Peter's like, what? You know, you know? like, you look like, Moses, you look like Charlton Heston, you know. Um, anybody ever tell you, Moses, you look like Charlton Heston? Um, I mean, I, I think uh, that's, that's my, it took Russell a few seconds, but he got it. Uh, he got there. I, I, that's my theory. I, I, that, that's, the, that's the closest, see, that's the closest I can come to make sense of that. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I know I'm not going to. <laughs> Yeah, in heaven, you get name tags. Yeah, so you get to heaven, and the angel's like, okay, and here's your name tag. All right, Nancy, here you go. Uh, Susan, here you go. Here's yours. And it says, hello, my name is, you know, something like that. And he's like, hey, nice thing. You are, oh, and what century did you come out of? You know, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, and you're like, ah, oh, you know. They did. Yeah, they did. They, yeah. Oh, yeah. Peter had the, yeah, first five books of the Old Testament memorized. And you're like, 
man, I know I know Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That looks like Moses. You know what I mean? That guy looks, dude, if I could picture Moses, it's like when I went to go see Lord of the Rings for the first time in 2000. All right, my wife and I just got married. We were married for like a week when the movie came out. And, and, and I grew up reading that book. I, in fact, nerd fact, I read that book once a year. I read all three books. It's actually three books in one. I read all three books once a year for 10 straight years. And so uh, when the movie came out, I, I, when I am enamored with the book and hear the movie's coming out, I always want to see if, if the director is going to put the image on the screen like I imaged it in my head. You know what I mean? And so, so I said, but Lord, Lord of the Rings, they did. I'm like, Galadriel. And when Gandalf showed up, I was like, that's exactly how I imagined it. I mean, it's like, I mean, that's Rachel. I had a tear rolling down my cheek, and Rachel's like, oh gosh, I can't believe I just married you, you know? Um, but I was like, that's exactly how I imagined Gandalf and everything, you know? And I, I think maybe Peter was like, that's, that's exactly how I imagined Moses. That's how Moses would look, you know? And that's, that's Elijah. But I, I, think, I think in the conversation, Peter heard their names. That's what I think. And Peter's like, what? You know, can I have your autograph? So, um, would you mind signing my walking stick? You know what I mean? <laughs> I just think the whole, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I don't think, I just think the whole scene is just like, and I think Mark is even amazed. He's like, check this out, you know? Moses and Elijah showed up? What is that all about? But, yeah, it's really neat. And the tabernacle thing. I want to build three tabernacles. And the reason why they didn't die is because Jesus was with them. And that's why. Because they knew that in order for me to be in this glory, a temple's got to be present, and there's got to be a bridge. There's got to be something blocking me to God, or I'm going to die. And Jesus is like, yeah, I got, I got this. I'm blocking I'm, you're, I'm, cover, I'm covering you. You're good. You're good, you know. So anyway, any other questions or comments? Or Very cool. All right. Well, Steve, you can cut it off if you want to. So I guess we're done.